Oh, uh, last lesson or, or last section on the water topic. Uh, Okie pokey, right, what is this lesson all about then? Well, we know that there's a rising uh, imbalance between rising demand and diminishing supplies and climate change is probably only going to make that worse along with other factors like rising population, a uh, huge amount of water that's been used for agriculture and industry. Uh, yeah, and economic development as well. So the last bit is, well, how can we manage this imbalance and the different contrasting ways? So 5.9a is concerned with really expensive techno fix, high tech, very expensive top down hard engineering projects like dams, transfer schemes and desalination plants. 5.9b is the opposite, so it's more of your low-tech, often bottom-up, sustainable uh, schemes where we use less water, conserve it, uh, more uh, sustainable and uh, irrigation methods that aren't going to use as much as, say, channel irrigation, for instance, so we'll have a look at that. Recycling water, you know, recycling wastewater to use again uh, if we've not got a lot of it. I'm going to have a look at a couple of examples of that. Uh, and then finally, we've, we've sort of covered a bit of this with Colorado River, uh, where, you know, it's not all conflict when we kind of... It's not always going to result in conflict where different users, different stakeholders disagree over how supplies should be should be kind of allocated. There are evidence... that There are, there are numerous examples of kind of par agreements or, uh, you know, frameworks where countries have gone along. So I'll give it a title then. Different approaches to managing water supply. Here we go. Right. So the two contrasting ways, if you just jot these down, two two key words. Uh, hard engineering. What is it? Well, technological fix. We use a lot of technology to manage water. Then it includes approaches such as dams, water transfer projects, and desalination. We're going to have a look at three case studies in a minute. Sustainable approaches, using methods that are more natural. So I've put a little picture here of uh, drip irrigation. So rather than flooding the fields, what we can do is we can put this kind of intricate system of uh, smaller pipes. Yeah, we can have tie simple timers. Uh, water crops at certain times of the day to avoid evaporation and you know it just drips a really small amount just enough just enough of what the plants need yeah so we're not wasting it so two different approaches all right right then uh, I'm gonna have emailed you uh, this table now you, you might want to again just uh, quickly sketch it yourself and draw it, draw it yourself if you can. Three case studies. I'm going to talk through them. You know, I don't want war and peace for these because there's going to be too much to remember. So I've pulled out some key facts. What we're going to do, we're going to be in a position at the end to evaluate hard engineering approaches versus soft engineering approaches. Because if this came up in the exam, I would bet my car that... It's going to be an assess 12 marker or an evaluate 20 marker. All right. So an outline of the project. What did it do? What are the benefits and the upsides? What are the costs? A couple of bits of data for the, and evidence as we go. You know, and then that this is your opinion. Yeah, we're going to explore this in lesson. But how effective do you think each one of these is? All right. Could score it from 1 to 10 if you like. So the three case studies. Three Gorges Dam, China. The South to North Water Transfer Project, China, and desalinization in Israel, but also other OPEC countries. So you can do it as a table, or you can just do it, lay it out however you want, really. But I'm going to email you the rest of the pages in your booklet if you want to use those. Right then, Three Gorges Dam. Uh, let, well, let's have a look at China first of all. So, let's have a look at these two maps. Here we go. Right then, if we have a look at this uh, map, which shows precipitation in millimetres. Yep, we've got the legend just to the left. Red and orange and yellow areas where there's low precipitation. 
purple weathers a lot so stark really night and day kind of contrast the south of china receives a lot of rainfall the north and the north uh, west in particular receives a lot lower levels of rainfall yep and just kind of further to the north uh, is the gobi desert which when we get onto the carbon cycle we do study a little bit so just just hold that thought in your breast yeah south a lot of rainfall north not much really contrasting pattern however if we look at the, where the demand is we see it's it's not quite as clear as that because we've got northern cities such as beijing and tianjin which are ha absolutely humongous uh they're in the north yep so you know there's, there's an imbalance in there if you think of that seesaw a lot of supply in the south not much in the north but we've got the demand in the north as well as the south yeah uh, yeah china very densely populated in the east as well right then three gorges dam let's have a look show you a picture first of all in fact i'm not going to picture the dam how bad's that but i have got one of one of the turbines all right and i'm just going to tell you some facts and figures here so i'll be filling these in on your table uh, the three gorges dam it was built on the yangtze river uh, it's got state-of-the-art turbines to generate hydroelectric power and that's probably one of the big plus sides to this for a whole range of reasons and there's a lot of links to other topics here as well uh, so hydroelectric power its energy production is around 22,500 megawatts yeah a uh, humongous amount of electricity uh, other benefits it increases shipping capacity on the Yangtze River so it's got a series of like locks and sluices so ships really large ships can get up and down the river another benefit is that it reduces and controls flood risk further downstream yeah you can choose when to open the gates and spin the turbines and when to close them all right a synoptic link to the carbon cycle when we get onto it is this hydroelectric power plant reduced greenhouse gas emissions massively all right and the amount that it reduced it reduced greenhouse gas emissions by 31 million no sorry by 100 million tons yeah per year because if it wasn't for this hydroelectric power plant on the three gorges dam china would be burning 31 more million tons of coal per year so because they can generate it this way the chinese don't have to burn 31 million tons of coal and that reduces greenhouse gas emissions by 100 million tons of co2 the negatives then the downside if we're going to evaluate this uh it flooded archaeology archaeological and cultural sites uh, and 1.3 million people were displaced so obviously when you block off the river it floods a huge area behind the dam to create a reservoir so 1.3 million people displaced and had to move some of those did get paid off and got compensation uh, but obviously uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a downside to that uh, it's obviously affected environment and ecology there's a lot of sediment that's trapped in the reservoir that can't get downstream not only is that a problem sedimentation build up behind the dam but also downstream because there's not as much sediment uh, the water's kind of got more, more more erosive power so you tend to get more erosion downstream and there's been an increased risk of landslides all right uh, now then the second project, the South to North Water Diversion, uh, it, it's kind of a separate project, but it involves the Three Gorges Dam as well for one of its uh, routes. So I'll just show you a few pictures here, a few maps. Maps are handy for this. Right, so we've got the Three Gorges Dam. Uh, the red, I mean the bluer rivers, natural rivers, the red lines 
are where we're going to divert those rivers. All right. So there's three routes basically from the Danjiang Kiao Reservoir uh, on the river Han, by the looks of it. Uh, there's the central route where we're going to divert water to Beijing. Really thirsty city and Tianjin as well. Uh, and then you've got the eastern route which diverts the Yangtze to Tianjin and the western routes planned and that's more in the kind of mountainous regions of Tibet near the Himalayas uh, where they're going to divert one of these rivers into the Yellow River yeah now downstream countries other countries as well are going to kind of suffer because of that so we'll get onto that in a minute but yeah basically what is it I mean it does exactly what it says in the tin diverts water from the south to the north using three different routes yeah have a look at what they look like it's a mixture so in your outline box it's a mixture of tunnels canals like you see here tunnels and canals pumping stations uh, they have to go through mountains they've also what about this they've got to actually <laughs> uh, tunnel under the yellow river yeah really i tell you really large scale hard engineering project if ever i've seen one uh i've got another little picture here yeah so you can see the scale of it the length of these three canal systems uh is between 300 to 450 kilometers long so i'll make a note of that uh and the middle section, the middle route, is the largest transfer project anywhere in the world. Right then, advantages. Well, the first advantage, clearly, is that the more arid north is going to receive water. Yep. So, 44.8 billion cubic meters of water annually can be transferred. Wow. Wow that's a lot uh, and that that is really the ma major benefit the other one is for the environment actually previously we had a look at how uh, northern china had have been having its aquifers over abstracted for, for 40 40 or 50 years and it led to cones of depression, the water table had fallen and, and, and you know, it was really difficult to, to kind of access them. Uh, and it had dropped something like, I don't know, 20 metres, I can't remember the exact figure, but yeah, it's in your booklet. Because the Chinese can find uh, and transport the water from the south, that's meant, write this point down folks, that it's prevented the abstraction of 800 million cubic meters of water out of these aquifers so it's letting them recharge yeah which is a good thing uh, so their aquifers in the north can recharge because they're not having to abstract them anymore because they've got a stable and secure supply happy days yeah wonderful stuff uh, however it's got a few pitfalls uh, number one being downstream countries yeah they're off the map in this example but these drainage basins some of the rivers flow north some of the rivers flow south and China are kind of diverted them before they flow into downstream countries so countries that are not too happy about this India Bangladesh Thailand Cambodia Vietnam yeah uh, the other downside, depending on how you look at it, is as with the Three Gorges Dam as well, the projected or expected costs are never hit with these things. So they expected it to cost 62 billion US dollars, but it ended up costing 79 billion US dollars. Yeah? Uh, yeah, these things never run to budget, they always go over forecasts. All right then. Right, your third hard engineering kind of high tech fix 
is desalinization or desalination, whichever you want to call it. I'm, I don't really care, to be honest with you. Uh, and desalination, we don't have to be chemists here. Yeah, but if you do the chemistry, you'll be interested in this. Uh, what is it? Just make a note, keep it simple. It just desalination just extracts or removes the salt from seawater uh, and it uses a process process called reverse osmosis and that's all I need you to know yeah it just removes the salt uh, from seawater and it applies a pressure to do it yeah so you end up with the salt being trapped and the fresh water uh, being available to use so reverse osmosis Remove the salt from seawater. Right then, a couple of examples. If we have a look at, let's have a look at a plant first. So yeah, the first thing you notice is it's got to be near the sea. You need a constant supply of seawater to actually get into the uh, power plant, to get into the plant, extract the salt, and then you know what happens is you actually they actually normally dump the salt back in the sea, or as some OPEC countries do, like Saudi Arabia, you end up with salt mountains. So, whereby the salt that you've extracted is a waste product that you've got to dump somewhere. Uh, probably could use it in this country, actually, for gritting roads, couldn't we? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, look at the countries what are actually doing this, and you'll spot something. Saudi Arabia... United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, Qatar, Bahrain, Amman, Iraq, Iran. You'll notice that, well, a couple of things really, if you're paying attention. One, the naturally very arid desert countries. So they need methods like this to actually meet the demand. All right, so it works well for them. And two, they're all OPEX, so the oil producing countries as well. And the reason why they seem to think it's perfect for them to actually use this method is because it's really energy intensive so it uses you need a lot of pressure in this reverse osmosis process you need a lot of pressure to be created and it's high tech it's expensive uh, and these countries are all oil producing countries so they can use that oil to, to meet the energy need to actually do it yep they don't have to uh, buy oil from anybody else because they produce it themselves so yeah and if we think of Israel 50% of Israel's drinking water comes from the ocean yep and they desalinize it uh, so that's a lovely bit of evidence as well right then couple of uh, advantages so the advantages of this are it produces really high quality and high purity fresh water so it's almost perfect you know they don't have to treat the water out of rivers uh, once they've done this process the product they're left with is super high quality and really pure all right second benefit I guess for these countries is if they've got a coastline and they've got and they've got energy supplies and they've got investment and the money and the finance to invest then you know it's kind of uh, they're, they're using the resources they have and creating a resource which they don't have so it kind of makes sense uh, Saudi Arabia is the country in the world that does this the most if you want to make a little note of that as well the downsides the residue and salt that's left as a as a waste product needs to be needs to be processed what do you do with it there's two things you can do with it one dump it back in the sea which then kills the marine life uh, it affects the marine ecosystems in the sea or two you can dump it in the desert and then you've got salt mountains all right uh, the other downside is it's really energy intensive so if we're thinking of climate change, CO2 emissions, you know, if we burn oil to actually create the energy to do this, then we might be solving as water security problems, but clearly it might be creating another one. 
Right, folks, so that's three good examples for hard engineering. And you've probably got others as well we've touched upon in the course, like the Hoover Dam in Colorado. You know, but I think I think the three gorges, south to north transfer project and desalinization are probably the, the biggest top down high tech uh, approaches. The opposite of that, and that's why I've done all these in green because it's a bit more environmentally friendly. Uh, more sustainable approaches to water management and there's three case studies we're going to look at one is sustainable management in Israel so as well as using desalinization uh, they've got some more bottom bottom up techniques rainwater water harvesting projects in China and then the four national taps uh, project in Singapore right then again I've emailed you this page if you want to uh, edit it or print it off and make notes on this you can do it, it'll be neat and tidy then right so Israel what are they doing well first thing drip irrigation All right. Uh, what is it you can say it's drip irrigation a smart irrigation system it's where water drips slowly to roots plant roots through a pipe system reducing waste and evaporation so little holes in these pipes, they're on timers, simple pumping systems, it's low tech, it's cheap uh, and it, you don't lose a lot of water to evaporation because just the amount of, right amount of water is needed to water the crops, happy days. The other thing they do is really strict conservation techniques, so uh, water meters, yeah, you can't waste water in Israel, it's kind of frowned upon. Uh, what else do they do? They charge real value prices to reflect the supply the supply of the water and the cost for managing ecosystems. So it's probably going to be a bit more expensive. Hence, they encourage you to use less. Uh, they also recycle sewage water to use to, for agriculture. Uh, and sick, because obviously ag agriculture is the, one of the biggest demands globally. So if we can, if we can use smart irrigation, use less and recycle wastewater uh, to water crops with, then you know we're we're a long way there to solving the problem, aren't we? Uh, and another thing is importing foods, which cost or use a lot of water to grow. All right. So if you want to grow crops that are really water, th the really thirsty crops, then you've got to find that water supply from your country. If you let another country grow the crop and you just buy it off them, basically they've had to find all the water to grow that crop. And we call this virtual water, where it's kind of water transferred and it's embedded in products. Yeah. So if you buy an iPhone, it's probably cost ten thousand liters of water to actually produce that phone. So if you import that from China or Taiwan, they've spent the 10,000 litres to produce that foam. Yeah. Uh, yeah, advantages of virtual water. It prevents the host country using their own water for production. Yeah. Uh, so just import the goods that are really kind of use a lot of water. Yeah. So that's Israel, nice and simple, really. The second one, this is my favourite favorite case study ever and I studied it as a student as well when I, when I were a nipper studying my levels uh, but yeah it is my favorite case study ever so a bit of background uh, rainwater harvesting in Gansu now you can see here China Gansu province in China it's kind of north central but it is yes yeah, it's, it's towards the north so we know from looking at that map earlier it's quite arid yeah not a lot of rainfall uh, it tends to come in three months of the year, so make a note of that. 60% of the annual rainfall comes in the three months between July and September. And annual rainfall levels anyway are really low. So, yeah, and it's one of the most poorer rural areas of China. No cities are nearby, all right? It's not like Beijing, the really huge urban centers. You're in the sticks, you're in a rural area. Poverty is really high. Uh, yeah so and what tradition traditionally the villagers have used clay lined underground systems for storing surface runoff all right but these weren't always successful because in really dry years when they receive less rainfall than that uh, people having to walk long distances 
go to rivers, depend on government water trucks, you know, so it, it, they've got they've got a problem. Okie pokey. Right then, so what is the Gansu rainwater rainwater harvesting project? It's like it's the best case study ever. Right, put simply, these these are the uh, homes in the villages. It's really bottom up, low tech, cheap technology, if you can even call it technology. You swap your clay roof tiles for tiled slates, and what happens is the water hits those uh, tiled roofs, goes into a gutter or a cemented channel if you like, so there's gutters coming off the roof into these channels in the kind of courtyard area and then gravity takes over, it takes the rainwater and eventually it just gravity means that the water falls into uh, a water cellar which is underground so underneath the ground there's a big water tank people don't really need to do anything to tell you the truth they just have to set up the system and when it rains it stores the water now let's have a look then bit more detail here we go if we think of kind of who's involved and when it started like I say it's a while ago now 1988 that's why I mean I studied it in what 99 2000 time uh, but if you just make a little note it's called a one-to-one -one project for harvesting and water conservation uh, so each family was given by the government the equivalent of one clay tile roof two cement water tanks and plastic sheeting and that would be enough to grow crops on one field so it's like a one-to-one -one project they called it at the time one roof channels water into two cement water tanks so they could water crops on one field uh, the Gansu Research Institute they launched it the government thought it was such a good idea they said you know what rather than us sending trucks to you every year we'll just help you pay for it it's dirt cheap uh, you build the tanks yourself dig the holes we'll give you the tiles happy days everybody thought it were a good idea this uh, benefits then well look at this for successfulness and how fast it kind of uh, caught on by 2000 so just 12 years later over 2 million water tanks have been built uh, and it supplied drinking water for nearly 2 million people yeah could irrigate 236,400 hectares of land uh, it's I mean I can't think of a disadvantage to this it's like happy days across the board in it this woman here with a smiley face she's giving it the thumbs up yep giving it big uh, so the result very sustainable bottom-up approach to securing water supplies it's good for environment it's good for uh, rural dwellers and the people and it's good for the local economy you can sell the crops what they've got left over uh, happy days <coughs> the third one Singapore and it's kind of holistic management now holistic management just means they're using a mixture of different strategies yeah a joined up approach uh, so right what did they do well first thing to think about is how many people live in Singapore 5.4 million yep yeah? there's a high water demand what did the Singapore kind of government do well it metered water just like Israel so you know if you pay more for it chances are you're not gonna waste it they educated the public in how to reduce their water use uh, they cut leaks to just five percent I mean, if you compare that with a UK average, UK leakage is about 20%, which is quite significant. The prices rise and fall with the usage and the supply. So, you know, if, if they're going through times of drought, for instance, then and people are using more, the price is going to go up because they're on a meter. <coughs> they'll be encouraged to use less. And they also... Uh, collected the rainwater in in water butts and like barrels uh, to use themselves now the four national taps project it's called is it's kind of this you know, different approaches so <coughs> make a note of these 
one local catchment of water so it's like rain water collection really two the rebranded uh, water uh, recycled water as new water so uh, people wouldn't like think oh I'm not drinking that so they kind of rebranded and educated people and said look this is safe we're, we're uh, advocating that you, you buy this new water and it'll be alright three like Israel again similar kind of idea the imported uh, water and and kind of any goods and uh, crops that were uh, water that used a lot of water they imported them so they didn't have to uh, use the water to grow them themselves and then four because it's, Singapore is quite wealthy you know they have got the technology they're surrounded by ocean then they desalinated water as well so it's kind of, this is kind of like a mixture of different strategies you've got your low cost bottom up strategies and then you've got your higher tech kind of desalinization uh, strategy as well. So this is a mixture, yeah, of both. Right. I think we'll leave it there, folks, actually. If we've got anything else to do, I think we'll do it in lesson. But yeah, I'll email you the tables if you want to make notes that way. But yeah, these are important case studies, these. So... You know, if you do have to go back, or if you want to, I'll, I'll click back on the slides. If you want to add to your notes, then do it because it will be a big question. This I can't see a six mark explain question. Like explain how hard engineering can can uh, solve water supply issues. It's never going to be a six mark question. This is going to be a twelve or a twenty marker. So you're going to need your support. You're going to need your case studies you're going to need uh, some facts and figures yes i've tried not to make it overkill but yeah i'm going to click through the slides if you feel that your notes are flimsy pause it now and add to your notes other than that ciao